Hello and welcome to this special briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. Our special guest today is Dr. Real Khulata, a senior fellow at the Federation for Defense of Democracies and previously National Security Advisor in the Bennett Lapid uh, government. Hello, Dr. Khulata, and thank you for joining us again. Thank you, um, Yonatan. Thank you to the Jerusalem Press Club for organizing this. So, um, we have uh, two topics I would like to discuss today, and uh, unfortunately, we had also incidents in the news relating to them. Just the past hour, we had, uh, according to the reports in the news, uh, more than 60 launches of uh, rockets uh, to the north. Unfortunately, we have there's also a reserve soldier who was badly wounded in, in one of these. And earlier in the morning, we had a um, dreadful car ramming, a truck ramming attack in the West Bank on Route 60. Um, I would like to discuss both these fronts, the Northern Front and where it's headed, and uh, also the, the West Bank, the idea of operations in the West Bank, and uh, where are they going? Uh, I don't mind which you want to tackle first, first but we'll, we'll address both of these issues. Okay. Well, if your permission, uh, I will start with the incident uh, you didn't mention, and uh, that's the uh, Black Hawk accident uh, uh, over the night in uh, Rafa Crossing. Uh, an opportunity to pass uh, condolences uh, to the family and uh, uh, hopefully successful recovery to the to the crew and to the soldiers. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, very hard incidents uh, uh, all over. Um, uh, we've, we've been talking in, in also in recent briefings. Uh, Israel is indeed engaged in uh, uh, in about seven fronts, not all of them at the same um, uh, level. Uh, at every point in time, but definitely at the moment, um, uh, escalation in Gaza uh, or the, the the situation in Gaza and the lack of uh, of route towards a ceasefire seems uh, uh, as if it's formalizing. I mean, it seems like we're going to be in this situation uh, for a long while. Um, unless something dramatic happens, which is difficult to see uh, uh, what it is. Uh, escalation in the West Bank um, is not, I think, as um, as uh, Sinwar would have wanted it. He wanted the West Bank to, to erupt and inflame months and months ago, but, but it is, uh, uh, it is uh, growing and, and the influx of, of, uh, of weapons, money, um, uh, and influence uh, from Jordan into the West Bank is something that the IDF is is confronting uh, uh, in stronger numbers. We can also talk about Jordan a little bit. I think it will be worth a while to spend some time on uh, um, on that. Um, but let's start with Lebanon, then go to the other to the other fronts. The situation in Lebanon um, is is very volatile. You know, I mean, for those of you who've heard me in previous uh, briefings, every time we talk about it, um, someone asked the question. So. What should we expect to happen in Lebanon? And every time um, I start by saying that it depends heavily on what happens in Gaza, but since there is no resolution or um, nearing a ceasefire in Gaza, I think the situation in the north cannot uh, fundamentally uh, uh, de-escalate. Um, uh, earlier this week here in Washington, there was a huge uh, um, Middle Eastern uh, conference and, and, and many prominent people spoke and explained their perspective from the American uh, side. It was Chatham rule, so I won't uh, uh, give the details from it. But by and large, I think we can all uh, understand that the efforts, uh, which are quite substantial, that the administration has been trying to put in all of those fronts uh, uh, is not likely to lead to the, to the results um, that were needed. Uh, there can't be any arrangement in the north without ceasefire. Uh, in the south, and it, um, and 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 while this is happening, we see escalations. Now it's like a, uh, it's like a, a very bad game where we punch and they punch and we punch and they punch and every time we punch higher and they punch higher. Um, Naria, uh, I think I, I may have mentioned Naria in one of the previous briefings as an example of a place that Hezbollah is not shooting at because they know that we haven't evacuated Naria. Um, when I proposed that, I think it was a mistake to to ev uh, evacuate all of of. Of the population from the northern border, well, it doesn't matter anymore because if they're shooting at Naria, um, then this is the case, and and just mere luck that um, uh, the family wasn't um, uh, harmed, uh, and no casualties so far there. Touch wood, and I hope that this uh, uh, continues to be so. But but this this in, in this high level of, of volatility, 
um, the chances of, of something dramatic would happen um, if Majdal Shams wasn't enough. Um, you know, then one can see, okay, so the level of, of the ability of Israel to absorb is high, but I, I don't think so. I think that uh, um, uh, the fact that we did not respond properly at Majd al-Shams, uh, I think is a mistake, but it doesn't mean that we'll continue to make these mistakes uh, uh, over and over again, especially as uh, the other constraints are are changing. The fear of, of an Iranian direct attack, I think, has been a bit mitigated uh, um, and for that, I, I think also for that reason, you hear the rhetoric of of the Israeli uh, uh, both premiers, the Minister of Defense has been talking about moving the center of gravity to the north, and and um, and the generals and chief of staff of the of the IDF. Um, it for sure uh, serves a purpose of of uh, I wouldn't use the word deterrence because I don't think it exists uh, definitely this time, but as as a warning for sure. Understanding that Hezbollah is not interested in the war in these conditions, um, but I think it also serves an understanding of, uh, of of a message to the Israeli public and to the reservists and to the IDF. This uh, uh, could happen, um, and uh, and that we all need to be prepared uh, uh, for that. So that's about Lebanon. If you know someone wants to ask more specific questions, I can I can answer. As for the West Bank. Um, so the West Bank has been... Uh... Can I just ask you about yeah, Lebanon sure. before, before we move on to the West Bank? Uh, there's been, in Israel, there's a massive um, argument which has become also political about uh, the, the hostage deal. Now, uh, opponents of the deal are saying, you know, um, those who are for a deal are barking at the wrong tree because the, the, the person calling the cards is Sinwar. Can I ask, in a potential scenario where Israel would do a deal that it likes, which means it's got 40 days of, 42 days of pause and can return to fighting. Would Hezbollah take this opportunity to climb down its tree and not climb it back up if Israel resumed fighting? So first, uh, uh, I think that Hezbollah, that is my uh, analysis or estimate, right? I don't, I don't see the intelligence uh, directly, but I think that Hezbollah will use the opportunity uh, to de-escalate as well as long as, they, as there is a ceasefire. What you ask is, is, is different. What if if uh, if the war resumes, um, it's hard to say. I think that Hezbollah might want to refrain from going back and using you know excuses that this is not really their war. But if if we will get back to a, a high hostility war in Gaza, uh, I think we should expect Hezbollah to show the kind of uh, uh, not very strong, but yet indeed the material support that they've been providing to to Hezbollah. Uh, to Hamas, uh, by Hezbollah, and um, I think um, uh, they go hand in hand uh, in a ceasefire, and, and I, I presume that they will go back, hand in hand back uh, if we restore fighting in some conditions. Right? If it's a short uh, a period, if it's surgical, if it's then maybe there will be uh, uh, some conditions or excuses that Hezbollah can tell to themselves. Because I think they would rather stop for the moment. I think they they need to. Uh, to regroup themselves and to replenish themselves and and um, um, and to deal with things domestically uh, uh, while they're at it. Um, so this is my observation um, on that. I, 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 by the way, I you know personally, we can talk also about the hostage deal and about Philadelphia if you want. I uh, um, uh, I think that this this should not be a very high argument this way or another. I think the question of the, the 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 moral base of the importance of bringing the hostages back should stand in itself and it should be dealt with the uh, conditions in in Gaza uh, uh, after such a long war uh entering also already entered the the 12 months of 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 the war um and I think that these this is why we need to do this everything else is 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 temporary anyway I don't believe that uh um uh uh, just a ceasefire in the north will be sufficient. We will need to engage in other means uh, uh, to ensure the security of the population uh, uh, um, in the north. We've degraded Hamas enough to know that if we can prevent replenishing, and there is importance, a huge importance in preventing replenishing uh, uh, into Gaza, I just don't think that IDF presence along the, the Philadelphia corridor is the solution to that. But, but there is a huge importance of that so that Hamas cannot 
do anything of the sort that they did in October 7. Again, clearly they can't do this now and prevent replenishing. Then we have uh, the ability maybe to reshape what's happening in, in, in Hamas, in Gaza. This is not the case in Lebanon. In Lebanon, uh, uh, we have uh, fought with Hezbollah and we've degraded uh, to some extent uh, their capabilities and we attacked their, their, their uh, I think, premiers in, a, in a, a surprisingly effective way. But this does not prevent Hezbollah, should they want to uh, surprise us either through the border or definitely with rockets. And, and we have to, to find another uh, means and solution uh, uh, to that, hopefully short of war. Um, so what I'm saying is that this temporary seize is important because we need it. Uh, uh, our, the, the economy needs it. The society needs it. The IDF needs it. Uh, but this shouldn't be the, the argument to, to make the hostage deal. We just need to make the hostage deal. Okay, I, I would like also to add from to everything you said that we saw a clip, I saw a clip in the news of people filming on their phones a Hezbollah UAV flying over the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret, basically undisturbed. I mean, it, it needs to be it needs to be said that, that Hezbollah has almost air superiority of sorts in the north of Israel. Of course, they don't have fighter jets, but um, I, is it true that Israel doesn't really well, I... have... This. I, I won't use that uh, term, Jonathan, with your permission. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, <laughs> uh, 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 they definitely dominate the the media and the social media, definitely. Uh, but I have to say that uh, Israel is inferior on those mediums, uh, regardless of its uh, operational capabilities. We just for too many years have, have deserted uh, this field without understanding of how damaging strategically that is. Uh, but having said that, yes, of course. I mean, Hezbollah has uh, performed uh, very well with with the different kinds of of, of drones, and uh, unfortunately, the defense first the detection, then the defense capabilities of of the IDF on those are just insufficient. Uh, it's just a fact. Uh, we know it is hard. Right, this is something that uh, was on my table as national security advisor. We always knew it was hard. Um, you look at what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, there are generational leaps, um, both on, on technologies of, of drones and detection uh, every few months uh, uh, in the conflict in Europe uh, with Ukraine. Um, and there, it's, a, it's a, a field where the, the innovation in the offensive side is, um, uh, is, is way more effective than on the defensive side. That happens a lot. But in this case, we just see these materials. Uh, in front of us, we need new technologies and new techniques uh, to detect those drones. Uh, I don't think it's a very hard problem. It just takes time and focus. And unfortunately, we didn't invest in it enough uh, uh, in, in the time when, when we had it, and we'll need to fill this gap. Uh, but it's very disturbing, right? I mean, those drones, uh, they don't just take pictures. Some of them have uh, uh, weaponry on them. It's not a lot, but you don't need a lot to, to kill um or to damage a facility or a, or a home unfortunately we will need to uh, deal with this and we will i'm not i'm not worried fundamentally we've found solutions to more difficult problems than that but at the moment they have uh, the upper hand yes okay so i'm going to i'm going to use this to say to the west bank and i would just like to say um the intensification of arms and 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 smuggling of of uh, you know uh, bombs and also money through the Jordan border, the Jordan Valley border, um, into the West Bank is not a new thing. It's been going on uh, for months before the war, and it looks like the IDF has now kind of caught on. And I would also like to mention that um, in pieces I read, drones are even used to transport small payloads like a couple of M16 uh, guns or a grenade. I mean, the, the, the way terror operates in the West Bank is different. It's a more like a targeted, uh, um, terror attacks and not like the massive things we saw on October 7. And yet the IDF over the past, I don't know, three weeks or so has done major operations in Jenin, to Qam, uh, to Bas, uh, weeding out cells of uh, terrorists from various organizations, also Hamas, but also Islamic Jihad, which I assume all, all, lead, all lead to Iran. I mean, all this stuff that comes through Jordan comes from Iran in some way or other. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, Jonathan, this is uh, quite accurate, uh, and it's true that it hasn't started uh, recently. Um, uh, this phenomenon, 
started before I was national security advisor and also uh, during, but I think it accelerated in, in magnitudes um, that are, are very, very worrisome. Um, um, one of the things we dealt with back in, in the previous government was um, in, in increasing the ability of, of the IDF and the police to monitor uh, the border. Um, at that time, most of what was smuggled was for uh, uh, crime. Uh, but as crime became nationalistic after uh, everything that happened in Guardian of the Walls, uh, it demanded more more focus and things uh, started. But um, I think what we're experiencing, what I understand from, from the people I talked to, what we're experiencing in the last few months is um, is a huge flux of uh, um, um, with a lot of resources associated with it, um, uh, ammunition, money, drugs. Um, uh, this is uh, this is really serious. This is uh, becoming uh, dramatic, and um, and the fact that the border is so long and so un uh, now well protected is is especially problematic for Israel. This is the longest border of Israel. I'm not just talking about the West Bank because if it goes through the Bika'a to the Negev, uh, um, then maybe it's not as bad as going directly to Hamas and to Islamic Jihad, but um, uh, it's not um, uh, healthy for our, our, our culture. And as I said before, um, um, when crime becomes nationalistic and there is collusion between terror organizations and, and local communities, it's it's a problem. But the focus on West Bank specifically is, is crucial because it, this is where Iran is focusing their own attempt because there is Hamas and Jihad Islam infrastructure to absorb that, to take it, to distribute it, to use it, to plan accordingly and to coordinate uh, activities which are much more um, uh, broad and, and, and dangerous than the things we dealt with back then. You know, remember all the, the Lion Den uh, group uh, they were eventually completely dismantled, but of course there is uh, uh, much more uh, danger in, in Hamas and jihadic Islam activity there. I think the IDF, um, uh, the, the, the way that they're dealing with it is um, uh, reflects the level of, of risk and, um, uh, and threat that comes with it. Um, clearly, it would have been more difficult to do such things if there wasn't a war in Gaza. You know, just stating the obvious, everybody understands that. Um, uh, but but it, it is important to do it. Otherwise, we will get more and more uh, accumulation um, of of capabilities. You said before that Hamas is not conducting anything like they did in October seven. But if they will continue to build up their forces and if they will have enough uh, uh, trained uh, terrorists and cells fully armed along. The border, you know, I live in in Kfar Saba. I live in DC at the moment. But when, when we're in Israel, our home is is in is in Kfar Saba. The distance between Kfar Saba and uh, uh, Kalkilia uh, is not that similar from the distance between Khan Yunis and uh, Sderot. Uh, maybe even shorter. So, me, yeah, okay. so the, just... the needs the needs uh, uh, to to implement the lessons needed to prevent the ability of surprising. Uh, um, attacks on civilian population uh, along um, the the green line or the wall or or whatever um, we will call it is is important. Uh, we uh, we don't need to go through another trauma of any sort, even if it's it's way smaller than that. Uh, and there already have been incidents on communities along um, the 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 border with with the West Bank. So so this must be dealt with. Uh, unfortunately, it is hard. Unfortunately, there is also an incident where um, um, uh, an American uh, citizen was uh, uh, was killed. Um, uh, I understand that uh, the IDF has concluded its um, its investigation, and the conclusion is that this was not a, a, a directed uh, assault, but uh, uh, a collateral. Um, from a bullet that that bounced. This is what I read. I hope what I read in the press is 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 true. But in any case, it's just one event. There are others uh, uh, as well, and 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 um, I hope that this does not progress into a full uh, intifada from the Palestinian side. And I hope that we are able to to um, uh, to conclude effectively uh, in a timely manner uh, from our side. Let me just add um, in the West Bank, apart from Gaza. Which is surrounded by kibbutzim, which tend, you know, uh, to be, let's say, pro-peace camp and pro-left. Uh, there's an added headache in the West Bank 
of Jewish terrorism, of, of settler violence against Palestinians, which is uh, basically giving the military a headache. I mean, obviously, th this has always been around in some degree, but it, it, it also it seems that now it's become more intense and is basically just complicating both IDF actions on the ground in the West Bank, yes. as well as the case internationally. Um, yes. yes. Can you comment on that? Well, I, you know, I mean, the thing I'll say is, is the, this also, unfortunately, isn't a new phenomenon, but I think with this government of Israel, it has grown to dimensions that I don't recall or remember in any time, and, and even getting backing from, from prominent uh, ministers and, and political figures. Uh, I think this is dangerous for Israel. Uh, I've said this, I think, in, in previous uh, uh, briefings, and I will say it now. I think that uh, uh, Israel should not uh, uh, allow... Uh, uh, our citizens uh, to take uh, not only the law to their hands, but weapons to their hands. This is why we have a military. This is why we have a police. Uh, and if there are issues between the populations that uh, I think needs to be uh, uh, differentiated and and, um, uh, and, and distant, uh, the police cannot stand from the side when they see such uh, clashes. The military cannot stand from the side. Uh, and it's a mixture of, of burden, like you said, because the military has way more significant, I would say, roles to deal with uh, for the security of the civilians in Israel than engaging in that, but there is no other way. There is not enough police uh, um, in the West Bank, and, and the, I read in the media every so often and claims that the police do not want to engage uh, with it because of of, uh, of the political aspect that is running through the police. I hope that is wrong. I hope this is not the case. Um but it, this is uh, very, very complicated, and r rightly so. You mention it, and and uh, um, this must be dealt with. I, I, I'm not sure that this government is capable of doing that, but this must be dealt with very more, much more severely. Yeah, well, in, in their defense, I would say that they've been anarchists way before the war. Uh, disrespectful. Yeah, of the and history. I said that, Jonathan. I, we we had such uh, events uh, when I was national security advisor, and we had. Uh, 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 issues between the military and the police about uh, jurisdiction responsibility during the government that I served in, and uh, but the, the the numbers and the magnitudes are just out of the roof. Do you see um, any um, any possibility of us of Israel seeing IDF operations in the West Bank intensifying to what looks like a war? I mean, or is it because of the where the population is, is uh, you know, intermixed, Jews and Arabs, and uh, it's never going to reach those levels, and it's always going to remain at the level of raids. No, it, I mean, no. I, look, I think what will what will determine if this becomes something more substantial uh, is the level of organization of the of the, the Palestinian terrorists regarding this. Uh, this is not an intifada. As long as the civilian population in the West Bank is not fully involved and the security services of the PA are not engaged in it. Uh, it's very clear, right? We know what happened in 86. This was a civil protest uh, uh, that uh, turned very, very violent, leading to Intifada. And in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, uh, the PA security authorities uh, uh, took their arms against uh, the IDF and everything uh, uh, that came. Uh, from it later. This is not the case at the moment. At the moment, the civilian population in the West Bank, by and large, the Palestinian civilian population, by and large, is not engaged in this, and the IDF is confronting cells of Hamas, Jihadic Islam, and supporters. Very limited, very local, and hopefully it will stay this way. The security uh, establishment of the PA, as ineffective as they are, are not engaged in combat. They continue the collaboration with our security services, to the extent of, of, of uh, uh, that that can happen, and they're not engaged in conflict. As long as these two things happen, this will not be called an intifada, and the IDF will continue to operate, I think, surgically uh, uh, on the rather limited um, amount of, of cells uh, that are in the West Bank before they accumulate to larger numbers. But if this turns into an intifada, then we will have, uh, uh, I guess, something very similar to what we saw in the early 2000s in uh, Homat Magen, uh, a protective shield, or right, is that the English term for it? Uh, I hope we don't get there. I hope, I will eagerly hope we don't get there. I think this is unnecessary. I think the Palestinian uh, population and Palestinian Authority has a lot to lose if they go down that line. For Israel, for sure, we don't need this front uh, uh, to evaporate. We, we need to find ways to de-escalate 
uh, a war is not necessary in the West Bank the way I mentioned in Lebanon. We need different things uh, uh, in the West Bank to uh, to differentiate between the population and, and to lead to something that could be uh, a process with with an horizon, but uh, out of security um, arrangements uh, and not the other way around. But it, it definitely doesn't need to go through a full war in the West Bank and another intifada as Israel is, is concerned. Okay, thank you for this. Um, going to the Jordanian border, you said uh, the smuggling of weapons and, and money and drugs, etc., has intensified over the past few months. I mean, has has Israel not increased its patrols of the border or measures that could uh, um, prevent this? And I would also like to ask: Jordan is another um, U.S. ally. Uh, is almost seems almost like a weak link on the way to, on the route to Iran, like a perforated border where things can go through. So um, I would like to ask not just what Israel might do, but what the Jordanians might do, or perhaps even Israel and Jordan in cooperation along yeah. this border. So first, uh, I'm sure that the IDF has intensified its activities along the, the Jordan Valley. There has been uh, uh, reportings uh, uh, about that. Um, it's not easy. It's a long border, right? We're all focused on Philadelphia, and uh, the prime minister is showing maps about a, a strip that is, uh, I don't know, uh, about nine miles, uh, fifteen kilometers long. Uh, the Jordan Valley, in its entirely, is four hundred kilometers or four hundred fifty kilometers. Um, um, it's and, Israel's uh, longest land border, no? Correct. It's Israel's longest border, and Israel's least uh, protected border because this was a peace border. Um, and we bought, we built the the the. As, uh, um, all of you, I'm sure, recall we, we built a fence, a, a barrier to Sinai because um, the amount of trafficking, uh, not necessarily nationalistic, but uh, uh, drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, and uh, a flow of of, uh, of of illegal workers and immigrants to that border. We built the wall and, and by and large solve most of the issues along that border. By the way, not the nationalistic smuggling because they have more uh, money and they're able to to uh, have uh, uh, more sophisticated operations, I will say. But de definitely diminish the numbers. The Jordan border along its entirely is is in, in a large parts of it doesn't have enough offense. Um, so this is an issue. And and uh, and and the IDF uh, will need to deal with it and budgets appropriated and, and everything associated with it. But I want to talk about Jordan because I think the issue with Jordan, from an Israeli perspective, the problem is the Jordan-Israeli border. From a Jordanian perspective, the problem is the border with Syria, mostly, and with Iraq, because Jordan is in 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 a weak spot to vis-a-vis -vis Iranian influx of of. Of um, uh, of terror, of money, of drugs, and everything associated with it, not just because they're looking to pass that along uh, the border to Israel, to the West Bank, and to um, uh, weaponize uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Iran is after Jordan, and we see more and more writing about. It. Um, and you know, I mean, as Israelis, we can say this is not our problem, but everything that's happening in our neighborhood is our problem. And Jordan is indeed a partner of peace, even though most days it's difficult to notice this, especially in the population in Jordan. But it is uh, uh, but it is uh, a border of peace. Uh, and in this context, uh, there, there was always, and I'm sure there will continue to be, huge operational intelligence and operational collaboration between the Israeli establishment and the Jordanian establishment to do whatever we can to help Jordan First of all, keep their security, right? We don't talk about it a lot. The Jordanians don't like to talk about it about a lot. Uh, um, um, but there is consensus in Israel that, regardless with the, the rhetoric and the political situation with Jordan, uh, keeping Jordan intact is a national security interest of Israel. It's definitely a national security interest of the United States of America uh, uh, and of Saudi Arabia and and the other pragmatic Arab countries. It's becoming more difficult to do so. And I think the Jordanians are becoming more vocal about it. And this is why this is out in the press. And, and I'm sure that all of your outlets have been covering this. And if not, uh, why don't you? Because it's a serious issue. Um, and, and uh, you know, the things that Israel can do, I, I won't get into details on this, but Israel has done quite a lot to help Jordan protect its 
border with Syria against influx of uh, uh, ISIS and and, and 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 Iran supporters and you know everyone wanted to get into Jordan uh, uh, through that border and you know I won't get into details but I think um, uh, the defense establishment of Israel can be proud and the Jordan should be thankful for everything we did to protect them in that border but uh, there is so much need that more that needs to be needs to be done and it starts with Jordan Jordan needs to understand that this is a national security threat. Uh, um, and this will be difficult because it's, I think, easier on the streets to divert uh, the attention and hatred on us than to actually understand who is jeopardizing the security of Jordan. And that is not Israel, that is Iran. Um, and uh, and in that, we should have had uh, a shared interest. And hopefully we will have a shared interest um, um, uh, on that issue. It's serious. It's serious. And it's uh, it's also urgent. Okay, uh, let me just just add that Syria, I don't know if Syria can even be still considered the nation state, and Iraq also is, is, has been a mess for a very long time. Jordan is, is one of the few Arab states that are actually not defined by, by, by the negativity of the mess going around them. I mean, it, it, Jordan is a functioning country, so to speak. No, John, you're right, but, but I have, we have to, 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 I mean, you know, the problems in Syria did not start because of Iran, but Iran surfed the waves. A main reason why Syria is still not intact, and I'm not supporting Assad here, okay? But Assad could have already uh, uh, taken control in Syria. It's not an Iranian interest that Syria become a nation state all over again, because they will lose their influence and their grip. And definitely the same for Iraq. Iraq is more and more controlled by Iranian influence, both on the Sunnis and, and, and on the Shiites. There are Iraqi Shiites who don't like the Iranian influence, but it doesn't matter. There is increasing uh, 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 influence. Uh, um, and uh, I wouldn't say control because it's too strong a word, but over time they can control Iraq. Yes. And they, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, let's, I mean, let me elaborate. They're not trying to replace any regime with a different regime, but just to create a mess that enables them to send their advisors, etc., and, and use, as you said, serve the waves. Yeah, but Jonathan, I I'm sorry for for interrupting again. It, they don't do this because it's not as effective. Lebanon is in better control of Iran when Hezbollah is not in charge of Lebanon. That's a mindset. That's a proxy mindset. If Iran wanted to take over Lebanon by Hezbollah, they could have. They don't want to because it's easier to be a terror organization, a non-state actor that is does not have to abide by the international law and everything that is associated with it. So they don't do this, not because they haven't yet. I'm not sure it's in their strategy. They have all of the control they want all over those countries in the Middle East from the inside, and they don't have to materialize that into full takeover of, of the state. It's actually, uh, it, it causes burden. They don't want that burden. Yeah, I'm saying we agree that what they, what they prefer is basically the, the, yeah. the mess. I mean, yeah. um, so let's now move to, to, to Lebanon. Um, Israel has been saying for months that it's going to take Lebanon back to the Stone Age. And to be fair, it's kind of an empty threat because Lebanon is, is in a dire situation regarding electricity, regarding, you know, the political situation there is, is, is in shambles. There's, they've not managed, I don't know if their constitution allows them to, but they've not managed to stabilize the country for many, many years. And while the populace uh, is probably uh, mostly against the full-scale war with Israel, because they understand what it entails, and we saw this. We saw this in the people running away from the Dachia and people raising the rents, etc. But um, does this really... I know you don't like the word deterrence. Does Hezbollah care about all this? For what, from our side? Yeah. So yeah, I don't use the term deterrence because I, I, I think um, um, that um, what is lacking is, is, is a sheer understanding of, of, of the enemy um, that when the war ends, their situation will be far worse than it was before because their calculus of, of the result of the war is different. Um, they will call victory things that uh, we would never do that. So the, the entire uh, uh, lingo that we are using in conventional uh, state-related um, uh, affairs and, and, and context is just doesn't apply, I think, to, to, this, to this case. Uh, and we, we've been mistaken about this for many, many years. So just th uh, that's on the point of deterrence. Having said all of that, I think Hezbollah... To a certain extent, does care about what happens. Uh, uh, there is a, a vocal um, um, protest or criticism in Lebanon 
against Hezbollah throughout the time. It started after the Second Lebanese War. We felt it a lot during the, the, the negotiation and signing of, of the uh, maritime agreement with Lebanon. Uh, Hezbollah didn't want the, uh, the agreement to be signed, to be sure, right? Um, and um, um, But as they understood that uh, the Lebanese government needs that and that there is a lot of support among the population, uh, they had to, to do this and they got, by the way, criticism from their own constituency for it. But this is just an example. Uh, the vast majority of population in Lebanon does not want war. Um, uh, I don't think this has a lot of effect on, on Asala, but it has some effect on Asala. I don't think, I think his image as a protector of Lebanon is important to him. I think the ability to manifest the revolution uh, um, and uh, uh, comes hand in hand with at least being able to say to the people, that their situation is better, even though it, it may not be. Uh, and they cannot say this in Lebanon for, for many, many years. They care to some extent. I think the issue, though, is that uh, they are the vest for Iran. And I don't think Iran wants to lose another uh, uh, tool in this chess game, if you would, uh, other than Hamas. Hamas has been degraded uh, to, to a large extent. I don't think they want to degrade or Hezbollah to be degraded in a way because they want to keep them fresh because they understand that there will be or there might be a direct confrontation between Israel and Iran. And when if when that happens, they need Hezbollah first, maybe to try to deter Israel from acting because of, of the threat of the damage uh, uh, to Israeli civilian population. Um, and if this does happen, they need that as a uh, as a means uh, to divert the war from uh, from Iran itself and, and, and other issues. So I think this is what's governing Nasrallah's uh, thinking mo more than uh, uh, the public opinion in, in, in Lebanon. Uh, but in any case, um, this all leads uh, to the same conclusion that at the moment, this is not the, the, the time uh, appropriate for him to do that. That can change instantly, of course, but I think this is the reason why we hadn't had uh, deterioration into a full war so far. Okay. Um, I'm going to be maybe vaguely optimistic here and say, um, if Israel were to launch a major war in Lebanon today, we've seen, I think, um, I, I don't remember, about 10 days ago, we saw a, a massive, uh, quite large preventive attack by the uh, Israeli Air Force against um, rocket launchers in Lebanon, which uh, were apparently prepared to launch. It was a preemptive attack. We saw something similar a, a few days ago. And we're counting, I think in Israel, we're counting some, some, some civilians killed in Majl Shams and soldiers here and there. In Lebanon, our count is about, I think, more than 400 operatives killed. Very few civilians killed in those things. Every person has a replacement, but still this is damage. Is Israel now more prepared or thinks maybe what, what Hezbollah might do back is, is less intense than what, what was the situation 10 months ago? Or are we still at the level of rhetoric just trying to get them off the tree, and and the fact is that they could damage us as they would. I will suggest uh, I'll, I'll put this this way, and this is my you know among my personal lessons from from October seven, everything associated with it. I would propose to the entire establishment of Israel not to believe that the level of degradation uh, on Hezbollah changes dramatically the situation on the ground. Um, you know what we did, we did. And they will replenish what they can. And the people we killed, as you said, will be replaced. Uh, um, this is not game changing for, for Hezbollah. It's a serious uh, or, or organization. It's true we killed, probably killed more Hezbollah terrorists than we did in the in, in, in the second Lebanese war. Uh, but that doesn't count for much either um, uh, as well. I would, I would propose for the IDF to understand that if uh, at all, they've been able to learn about the new uh, operational uh, uh, tactics and um, and methods that the IDF has developed since the Second Lebanese War, and we did get the upper hand in any any conflict with with Hezbollah, they will learn now, and they will ask themselves: So, how do we overcome these uh, techniques, capabilities, weaponry, whatever uh, they uh, uh, they encountered? Uh, and we need to be very uh, serious in, in innovation and learning ourselves, so that we'll continue to have the upper hand in uh, future conflicts. Do you have any guesstimate on when the evacuees from the north will be able to return home? Well, I, I, I will say that first and foremost, this is a political decision. Um, I think the reason the people don't come back home 
uh, is because of lack of trust uh, uh, in leadership more than anything else. I mean, unfortunately, we know that the pe these people have lived along the, the border uh, under threat of rockets for decades before. And there were invasions into their communities in the 70s and, and, and later on. Uh, it only stopped in the Second Lebanese War during the time of uh, um, of the of uh, the uh, uh, barrier zone in the border of Lebanon. Uh, but after the withdrawal from Lebanon more than 20 years ago, there was always a tense environment. Unfortunately, they don't trust that the Israeli government will do what is necessary. And unfortunately, when the Israeli government continues to say, we will solve this problem uh, with military action, even though they have no intention of doing this in the near future. I think this adds to the lack of trust that the people have in the government. Uh, I think I said in one of the previous uh, briefings uh, many, many months ago that the government should have declared that on the 1st of September, we opened the school years in all of the communities in the north. I think I said that in March or April, uh, and I meant that. Of course, this is not what happened, and, and, uh, and now we're in this situation. I have no idea where the government wants the population to go to the north. I heard Prime Minister Netanyahu say that uh, nothing will happen if uh, if this will be uh, delayed for a few more months. I, I think uh, this is not good for the cohesion of the society of Israel, but he's the Prime Minister. He calls the shots. I, I cannot answer on his behalf. But, I mean, you're, you're describing a situation where um, basically the northern evacuees would kind of agree on trust to go back home and essentially serve as a sort of... A... <laughs> sitting duck for Hezbollah and hope the idea no. of protection. No, 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 the contrary. That is the purpose, and we shouldn't call this sitting ducks, but this is the role of the IDF, of the Israeli Defense Forces. The The population in the north needs to know that whenever they look north towards the border, there are armed soldiers alert defending the border so that no one can infiltrate through that barrier the way they did in October 7th. This is the first and foremost thing we need to do. This is very consuming. It calls for a lot of manpower. But this is how we restore a sense of security to the population. They need to know that the IDF will be there. Because the IDF wasn't there on October 7 for their uh, uh, our families, all our families uh, uh, in the South. This is the first thing that needs to do. Of course, there has to be also a message related to firing on heavily populated uh, uh, communities in Israel. As I said before, I think we did not respond properly to Majid al-Shams. And I, I don't think we're responding properly to Naria. I think there has to be a message to Hezbollah. You do not fire on civilian population, period. Because if you do, there will be consequences. Of course, these consequences can create escalation, but you need a strategy. And I think that if you deliver all of those messages by arms when necessary, but also diplomatically in other means, and you create new conditions, Hezbollah always talks about these equations. Who's writing those equations? Who's creating the precedents for those equations? Well, unfortunately, we are as well. No, no, I, I, I definitely did not mean that the population needs to be there and sit like sitting ducks. On the contrary, there has to be out of posture. There has to be out of, of strength, out of resilience of the IDF and of the population. This needs to be restored and it will be restored. I just, I'm, unfortunately, I don't see these decisions made by the current government. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very sorry to say that because I wish it was different. So, okay, basically you're saying um, we're back to the game of equations and what we need to do is that Israel sets the equation and not follow uh, Hezbollah, Hezbollah's equation. Because I remember after that strike on a Saturday morning, we kind of, uh, you know, went back to normal, which is raindrops of, of a rocket here, an RPG there. It's like, yeah. um, and Israel accepted this. Uh, but why? Why should we? Why should we accept it? Why should we let Hezbollah create the equations? I, I, I think the strategy is all, it's all skewed. If this is, uh, uh, done because in a matter of, of days or weeks we're going into a full confrontation in Lebanon. Okay. but And, and maybe it is. And maybe it's all part of a, um, a, of a campaign that will create conditions for us to do that. Maybe. I'm, I don't sit in the decision making of the government. And, and, and that is an option and a possibility. Um, but in any case, this is what I meant by strategy. The government needs to know and to give directions uh, uh, to all of the uh, organizations and apparatus about how to behave uh, one way or another. Doing neither is the worst. As we speak, by the way, there was a rocket in Matat, another one of those raindrops, so to speak, you know, uh, a red alert siren in uh, Matat along the uh, border with Lebanon. I hope no one was hurt. I don't follow the, the news during the briefing. Uh, I would okay. like to ask... Are we, uh, we'll get, uh, Jonathan, I'm sorry, we, we'll need to uh, uh, 
to, to, to wrap up uh, uh, soon. Do, do, uh, so, I have, please, one, go ahead. so I have one last question. Um, in the beginning of the October war, the Hamas war, Israel enjoyed a, a vast amount of international legitimacy, which dissipated relatively quickly. Do you think it's a factor in the calculations about Lebanon? Does Israel have the, the international legitimacy now to go full scale in Lebanon? A and B, supposing we're not doing it now to replenish the army, to refresh reserves, etc. Will we will have this legitimacy later on? Because this would be a proactive attack on Israel's side. So first of all, you know, the, the question of legitimacy is, is very, very difficult because there are many components to it. And there is a huge distinction between legitimacy to respond to an attack initiated by uh, the enemy, the legitimacy to a preemptive uh, action uh, by us. Uh, Israel preempted uh, a few weeks ago um, and got full legitimacy because of a very close coordination with the Americans uh, that made them understand uh, what uh, Hezbollah was uh, planning to do. And in these conditions, uh, uh, it wasn't hard to achieve that uh, uh, legitimacy. So I don't want to go into more details in this. This is a, a legitimacy, coordination with the, the, the Western uh, allies, specifically with the United States of America, is crucial. Uh, in any of the things uh, that we will need uh, uh, to do. I'm sure that the government deals with that. I know that there are deliberations on this, and I don't want to get into more details than that because it's uh, delicate and sensitive. Okay, Dr. Kulata, I'd like to thank you very much for your time once You're again. Welcome. And I hope we'll see you uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.